and I happened to overhear a father helping his daughter choose some sweets. And he said to the child, who was about three years old, get yourself some of them, when it should of course more probably be get yourself some of those. And this set me thinking about Pierre Bourdieu's work with Jean-Claude Passeron on reproduction in education, society and culture. You see, if that girl were to grow up to be the Oxford Professor of English Literature, she would have to learn that we don't say them when we mean those, and where she would learn it would be in school. So working class school children, as Bourdieu says, have a double burden. They have to learn not only the actual content of the lessons, but also a new way of speaking. So working class children start off on the wrong foot. That girl's father was communicating perfectly effectively, but she will learn that it was wrong. Working class children are failing right from the beginning. As a result, says Bourdieu, they're more likely to opt out, to decide that school isn't for them. So they don't do as well in exams, they don't get the qualifications they need for the best professional jobs, and they end up treading the same paths as their parents in manual and low-status occupations. And what Bourdieu says is that the school examination system legitimises this reproduction of the social order. The greater life chances of middle-class children can be justified by pointing to the seemingly objective measure of their better exam results. The exam certificates obscure the structural disadvantages of children from working class backgrounds. Bourdieu then extends this point to what he calls the cultural arbitrary. All cultural institutions, he says, draw a veil over some kind of injustice or exploitation, and that is their purpose. Whether it is men and women, young and old, or rich and poor, cultural norms and values not only keep people in their place, but hide the arbitrariness of inequality, presenting it as only right and natural. Bourdieu uses the term cultural capital for command of the behaviours that legitimise inequality. So speaking properly is a form of cultural capital. And I was thinking about all this when I happened to be listening to The Jam's greatest hits. And it occurred to me that these concerns have a central place in the music of Paul Weller. In Saturday's Kids, for example, we're introduced to the underclass, low in cultural capital. The iconography is from the 1970s, but Saturday's Kids live in council houses, wear v-neck shirts and baggy trousers, and the girls work in Tesco's and Woolworth's, and wear cheap perfume because it's all they can afford. Saturday's Kids live in council houses, wear v-neck shirts and baggy trousers. And amidst this litany of defining behaviours, we're also told that Saturday's kids live life with insults, and moreover that these are real creatures that time has forgot, not given a thought, it's the system. Saturday's boys could life with insults, dream lives of fear almost the hot time results, and I'm over here to draw real creatures that time has forgot. Why should Saturday's kids live a life of cheap housing, cheap perfume and casual insults when others enjoy material wealth and social respect? They're men and women, real creatures like the others. Why this inequality? Well, it's the system. Cultural ideas say it must be so and is perhaps even desirable. In Eton Rifles, we're urged to sup up our beer and collect our fags because there's a row going on down near Slough. In other words, there's a fight breaking out between the townies and the boys of Eton College, Britain's poshest school. However, we, the townies, the Saturday's kids types, come out of it naturally the worse. And, Paul Weller reflects, what chance did we stand against a tie and a crest? So, for the lower classes to be beaten back by the upper classes is in the natural order of things. And what makes it natural is the upper classes' possession of cultural capital, such as the Etonian school tie and coat of arms. Finally, in Mr. Clean, a thug sneers at the Mr. Clean's cultural capital. He has a smart suit, he went to Cambridge, and he reads the Times newspaper. But the thug
Doug is not impressed. In fact, he fights back against the cultural arbitrary, telling Mr. Clean, I hate you and your wife, and if I get the chance, I'll fuck up your life. Well, that's not very nice, we might think. Such offensiveness, such violence. But if we were to go back thousands of years BC to the earliest humans, the Mr. Clean and this thug would have been equals, making their living in exactly the same way. There would have been no Cambridge University or swanky newspaper to differentiate superior from inferior. Fast forward to today. Why should Saturday's kids or the Eton townies or this thug not only live a life that's materially impoverished, but be looked down upon as inferior. Is the violence of the thug's words any worse than the cultural violence that perpetually legitimises and reproduces the unequal situation in which he comes off naturally the worse? The point about culture, though, is that it's so ingrained we find it difficult to see the injustices over which it draws a veil. As a result, the true logic of social situations is often not at all what it seems to be to us. And many of our attitudes and opinions that we think of as so logical and reasonable, such as about relations between men and women, are little more than smokescreens for entirely arbitrary patterns of subjugation and exploitation. <laughs>